everything that we do and believe must conform to Scripture. We must have sound doctrine, correct theology. We must be aware of deceiving spirits. We must be aware of the deception of our own flesh, the vanity of our own mind. It could go on for hours. But I believe that God can visit His people in prayer. I believe that the presence of God is so real that God could show up right now in this room. And I would not be saying God's here because He promised to be here in the New Testament. I can say God's here because I know He's here. I believe that God, in seeking God, He can reveal His presence to the man seeking Him to such a, in such a degree that that man can throw himself to the ground and cover his head thinking that God's come to kill him. And yet that same God can raise him up and fill him with such unspeakable joy that he doesn't even know if he can contain himself. I believe that we ought to seek God. We ought to seek the fullness of everything God has for us. And we ought to seek to know Him. Experience Him. Now these are words, again, that are going to get me... Well, they already... I mean, people know Paul Washer's sort of reformed, but he's kind of dangerous. Because all this stuff can get spooky. Look, folks, the only place where things can't get out of hand is a cemetery. And that's what a lot of Reformed churches are. They're very proper cemeteries. And where there's life, and there's people being born again, and God is doing things, and oftentimes people are misunderstanding it, you are going to see things that aren't too respectable at times. You're going to see people that have to be guided a bit. Every revival. We're all praying for revival. If it came, it'd scare us half to death. When revival breaks out, folks, things start happening that oftentimes we can't explain. What was that one fellow prayed for years and years for revival? He's sitting in his church office and noticed a commotion out in the auditorium or something like that and was going out to stop it. He was madder than a hornet. When he went out to stop it, someone grabbed him and said, don't touch the ark of God. This is what you've been praying for all your life. He didn't realize what he was praying for. God can come into that prayer closet in such a way that you have no way to defend yourself. That you think some riff has opened up in heaven. And you don't know if you want to stay where you are or go back. God can come through a place. He can sweep in and take the mightiest of sinners and cast them to the ground. And no, I didn't get that out of books. I've seen it with my own eyes. He sweeped through a place and said 350 people straight to their knees in a foot of mud in a downpour in Asia under the wrath of God. And the thing is though, when that happens then we're no longer proper and we're no longer intellectual and we're no longer able to defend ourselves among the elite. And yes, things happen that are unexplainable. And yes, at the same time, things happen that young Christians misinterpret and act like a fool. But the fact is, if you want a really beautiful place, create a cemetery. And we need to be more to seeking God's power. I mean, you look at these. Even John Gill... I mean, everyone called him a hyper-Calvinist and everything, but read the things he just said on the day of Pente about the day of Pentecost. Well, this can get out of hand. Yeah, so can my three-month-old three and my three-year-old and my six-year-old, but that doesn't mean you know, everybody ought to be neutered so nothing gets out of hand. There is a seeking after God. There is a seeking after God and there is a coming of God. The old men talked about it and weren't afraid. We shouldn't be. I would say, I'll get... I, I, when I was, when I was 20, 22 years old, I'd go out street preaching on 6th Street in Austin, Texas. I was scared half out of my wits. I'd walk around a lot of times the whole night with my Bible and not be able to share with anybody or preach like a coward and go home. I got so mad that I finally walked one day I was in this, staying at this missionary's house. 
He let us have for the summer, me and a bunch of other students, guys, all trying to walk with God. And I just decided, as right after I moved out of there, I decided that either this whole thing is a hoax, and I knew it wasn't, but I said, where is the power? Where is the life? What did those apostles do? Did they just have like a, some kind of get-together in a football locker room and psych each other up and then had this power to stand against when, men when before they couldn't even stand against a little girl? And so here's what I did. I decided I was going to go in the closet and I was going to pray there until either God killed me or He empowered me for ministry. And what I did is I fell asleep 15 minutes after I started praying and all my roommates came home later and found me in the closet asleep and thought I'd totally lost my mind. And so I got an alarm clock and I put it in there. And I pray for about 10-15 minutes. That's how spiritual I was. I'd fall asleep and the alarm clock go off. I'd set it again for, for about another 15-20 minutes. I'd pray, fall asleep and go off. And it went on for months. And hours a night, I would just cry out to God, God, I don't care about anything. I don't care. I'm not asking you to save people in China. I'm not asking you to... I just want to know you, that's all. I don't want to be like I was. I, I don't want to be like I am. I, I, there's no power. There's no life. There's no... I, 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 just, I just want... I don't know what I want. I'm just going to sit here until I even know what I want. And then there was a retreat to go on a ski retreat to Colorado. And I thought, well, that would be good. And I felt like the Lord was just, if I went, I'd be in disobedience. So I went out west of Austin. I climbed up on a hill out there in the middle of some ranch, got permission. And I went crazy for three days. I would grab rocks and throw them up at the sky and beg God to come down. Something. Nothing happened. I went home. Went on for a couple more months. I was almost got to the point where I was crazy. And one night I cried out to God, I don't know how long, and God came. And I thought I was going to die. And I laid on my face, I don't know how long, I covered my head, I curled up in a fetal position, and I just laid there. And then all of a sudden, a joy that I had never known in my life. And my mouth shot open. Everyone gets really scared here. They think I'm going to say I spoke in tongues. Well, I didn't. But it was like everything I'd ever read in the book of Psalms came pouring out of my mouth. You just, just... After that, did I struggle with sin? Yep. After that, I struggle with fear. Yep. After that, I have all the common problems of sanctification. Yep. But did my life change? Yep. I started going out there and preaching. God was real. It's more real to me than all you sitting in this room right now. Now, I know talking like this just looks all arrogant and proud and everything, but... Folks, sooner or later, someone's got to stand up and say they really know God. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to... If I didn't tell you this, I'd be a liar. No, I'm not basing my life on, on experience. I follow the London Confession. Talk, read Charles Spurgeon. Every, I, I think, you know, people always say, well, you know, the Arminians, they just selectively read Charles Spurgeon. They don't read all the stuff about him. Well, the Calvinists don't either. Because some very, very strange things happened to Charles Spurgeon. God is real. Am I saying that someone has to do the exact same thing? Absolutely not. But am I saying that we ought to seek God and expect God to show up? Yes. May it take a half a year? Yes. Can I pray like that now, like I prayed like that? No. I honestly believe it was a sovereign act of God pushing me to prayer hours and hours and hours a day. Because I can't do that now. I can't repeat it. But, it, and I'm not, folks, I don't know, I, don't, I hate sharing that. I very rarely shared what I just shared here. But young guys, listen to me. This is more than correct exegesis. It's more than just you've memorized Boyce's abstract of principles. I mean, you need to do that, praise the Lord. But goodness gracious, 
These guys were men of God. And also at the same time, it manifests itself differently through the way God has made us. Not everyone's called to be a preacher, but everyone is called to seek God. You know, it's amazing. I remember at seminary, all the Korean students, and I befriended one of them, and I said, well, you know, why aren't the Korean students, why don't you hang around with anybody? And they never would answer me. And finally I asked one of them, I said, well, come on, I pushed him in a corner. He says, all right, if you want to know, we don't hang around with you Americans because we don't want to be carnal like you. I mean, this isn't necessarily... But, I mean, some, sometimes in some of those churches, they, they have to fast 40 days to be a deacon. I'm not saying that that's what we should be doing, but I'm saying, folks, there's a whole bunch of Christianity out there that isn't American instantaneous Christianity. It has to do with knowing God. 